And uh, we, of course, are still dealing with this uh, virus, and I'm afraid we'll be dealing with it for quite a while. And it's a scary business, isn't it? Wouldn't it be great if we could somehow deliver a knockout punch? There's some people out there who are promoting various kinds of immune boosters, saying that this is going to put an end to the virus. So this is what I'd like to address here today. I want to take a look at this. Uh, it's a very interesting kind of an idea, uh, but generally what you see in the media, what you see in the lay press is overly simplified. You can boost your car, right? We know this. And uh, with the cold weather that is out there, some of you may have already experienced this. It happens uh, you know, sometimes in, in the winter. And there's no question here, we can boost a car battery. We can also boost our muscles. How do we do that? Well, you do it by exercising. So there's no question here, we can boost our muscles. However, when it comes to the question of boosting the immune system, this is very, very different. Uh, the immune system is not like a car battery. It is not like uh, uh, you know, uh, our, our, our muscles. Uh, it is not something that can be easily boosted. But nevertheless, this, the term is uh, available and you know, people are using this expression all the time. So it certainly is worthwhile to uh, try to look into it because there are some facts that we can talk about. And unfortunately, there are a large number of myths that are associated with the uh, immune system. There's one fact that, that is not arguable. There is one way that we can actually boost the immune system, and that is by vaccination. And obviously, we have heard a great deal recently about vaccination, about all the different kinds of vaccines that are, are uh, uh, out there. And uh, we now have two, of course, that have been approved and, and two more that uh, are very close to approval. And uh, these, of course, really do boost your immune system. However, Let's make this clear. They are very, very specific. When you get a vaccine, it is specific, let's say for the, the virus that causes the measles. It's specific for the virus that may cause the, the flu. And of course, the one that we're talking about now is very specific for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, the one that causes COVID-19. So it isn't as if this were some sort of general tonic to increase the activity of the immune system, it is very specific. And you need a, a, a vaccine for every antigen that is out there. Now, antigens are, are basically the substances that, that the body recognizes as a foreign material and generates antibodies in response uh, to them. But the antigen that you have in the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is a different antigen that you have in, in the uh, smallpox uh, virus or, or you know, uh, in any other uh, virus. So a vaccine is very, very specific. The immune system is not one entity that can be boosted. So it's not like the car battery you know, that we talked about, which, which can easily be uh, boosted. This is a very, very, very complex uh, system. And the job of the immune system is essentially to recognize substances that are not part of the human body, something that, that potentially is harmful and something that, that we need to be shielded against. These attackers can be bacteria, they can be viruses, uh, they can be foreign tissues. Uh, for example, when you get a transplant, the body looks at that and says, gee, you know, this isn't part of my body. I better mount an attack against it, try to get rid of it. And that's when you have to use drugs like cyclosporin, which suppress the immune uh, activity. Then, of course, there are various fungi out there, toxins that the body has to protect itself against. 
So this is the job of the immune system. But the immune system is an extremely complex system. So once again, it isn't one single entity like a car battery. It is very, very complex. There are many organs that are involved in fighting off foreign invaders in very different ways. Um, first of all, uh, our skin is part of the immune system because it protects us, it protects entry uh, from uh, outside sources. Uh, our tears are part of the immune system because something gets into your eye, your body wants to get rid of it, you start tearing to try to wash it out. Uh, then, of course, there are all the, the organs in the body that can produce various kinds of, of proteins, uh, that can produce cells, all of which together can attack foreign intruders. So it is a very, very complex system. And just when you look at the number of cells involved in immune reactions, now these are, are white blood cells, but there are many, many different kinds of blood cells, and they have many different types of modes of action. Some of them will generate antibodies. Antibodies lock onto the antigen, inactivate it. Some of them can actually gobble up uh, an intruder. These are the phagocytes. Uh, they actually digest them. So each of these different kinds of cells has a different activity against foreign intruders. So the immune system is extremely complicated and it may be possible to invigorate in some specific way one part of this immune system. But there's no way that you can, quote, boost immunity because it's just too, too complicated. And uh, I think it's a very simple-minded idea that you could take some sort of supplement that uh, just boosts the immune system. <clears throat> now, of course, there are many different kinds of blood cells that are involved in fighting off foreign invaders, the white blood cells, collectively called the leukocytes. But there are several different types of phagocytes, for example. These are the ones that I just mentioned, which will basically gobble up any potential disease-causing organism. But these two have several different categories. They are the neutrophils, the monocytes, the macrophages, each of them perform in somewhat of a different uh, way. Uh, then you have uh, lymphocytes. Here too, you have two different kinds of these white blood cells. The B lymphocytes are the ones that produce antibodies. These are the ones that are triggered into action by vaccination or by having had a disease and the body then produces antibodies, nat naturally occurring uh, antibodies as opposed to what is done with, with uh, vaccination. And then you have the T lymphocytes, and these have a different function. Uh, whenever a cell in the body has been attacked, for example, by a virus or, or a bacterium and its function has been compromised, the T lymphocytes come around and they destroy these cells. So there are all these different mechanisms of action. So the takeaway message here is, that the immune system is a complex network of organs, cells, various chemicals produced by the cells that together have the chance of beating off foreign invaders. To put it into a nutshell, the immune system is multifaceted and it incorporates organs, tissues, cells, proteins, various biochemicals, and they go into action when they perceive that the body is attacked by bacteria, viruses, various fungi, parasites, toxins, and indeed any cells that have gone rogue, like cancer cells, which start multiplying without any, any uh, kind of preordained um, uh, order. So now we have some idea of what uh, the immune system is. <clears throat> There are several different kinds of immunity. Innate immunity is what we are born with because from the moment that we are born, we have methods of protecting ourselves. Our skin forms a barrier against outside substances. The mucous membranes 
lined the inside of the lungs. They inside the, line, lined the inside of our throat. And uh, attacking species have a hard time breaking through these uh, membranes. And as I said, tears, they will wash out uh, intruders. The hydrochloric acid in the stomach will break down substances that get into, into the stomach. And then you have a whole variety of chemicals like interferon, interleukin, which specifically can target and break down attacking species. So we are born with all of this. Then there's also something called passive immunity, which we get from our mother. Because as soon as we are born, of course, we are open to all kinds of attack. So uh, there are various kinds of antibodies that a baby gets from the mother. And uh, this is what is known as passive uh, immunity because it is passed on from the mother to, to the baby. Then the other class of, uh, of immunity is what is called adaptive or acquired immunity. And this happens once we have been exposed to one of these foreign agents that we call the antigen, and these will generate antibodies. Well, antibodies can be generated in one of two ways. A natural infection will trigger immune activity by the body and uh, white blood cells start generating antibodies so that the next time that the same intruder is, is uh, discovered, the antibodies go into action and try to uh, neutralize it. But you can also do this with vaccines because essentially with a vaccine, what you're doing is tricking the body into thinking that it has been exposed to an attacking agent without that attacking agent actually being dangerous, but it triggers antibody production. And this is what all vaccines do. Of course, they can do it in, in somewhat different uh, ways, but the idea always is to trick the body into thinking that it has been attacked by a dangerous substance Whereas the truth is that it hasn't been attacked by dangerous substance, but there's a similarity between the ingredient of the vaccine and the dangerous substance. So that once the body develops antibodies to, to the vaccine, it will also recognize uh, the real thing when it comes uh, in, in, into, the, uh, into the system. So these are the two basic kinds of, of immunity. Either we are born with, with it, some of it we get from our mother, or we acquire it through either natural infection or through vaccination. Those are the facts. Now, unfortunately, there's a very large number of myths that are associated with uh, immunity. Uh, there are many, many simplistic ideas out there and products that, for example, claim to give you immune support. Now, I, I can't say that these are absolutely useless because many of them will have all oh, substances like vitamins and minerals. And as you see in, in, in a moment, the immune system is so complicated and it requires so many different substances to work, including vitamins, minerals, etc., so that, that you can't absolutely say that this is totally uh, useless but it may help one little fraction of the immune system if someone is, de is deficient in one of these nutrients. But the way that these things are sold uh, is, is way beyond uh, what the, uh, the science can actually deliver. Uh, things like immune defense. Well, yes, you'll see in a moment, we'll talk about vitamin C, we'll, we'll talk about zinc, and they are important, they do play a role in, in the uh, uh, immune system, especially if someone has an extreme deficiency in it, which is generally very rare in North America. So these things are oversold. And the idea that, that you know, there are certain diets that can boost immunity, again, uh, this is overstated. It is true that if you have a terrible diet, then your body suffers in every way including your mechanisms for warding off intruders, that is your immune system. Uh, but that is quite different from saying that, that, that you can eat one specific food and boost your immunity, or that you can drink a juice 
uh, made of, of apples and turmeric and, and lemon juice and ginger uh, that will boost uh, immunity. Again, you know, it's, it's not as if this were 100% nonsense because it is possible that if someone has a diet that is a terrible diet, many diets in North America are, that they're just not getting enough nutrients and your immune system does need a whole host of, of, of nutrients. But again, to, to suggest that you're going to ward off COVID-19 by drinking some kind of immune boosting juice is an overstatement of, of, of the facts. Now, what is true that everything that happens in our body is somehow a function of food because it is the only raw material that goes into our body, right? We are built of the food that we eat our muscles come from the protein that we eat. Of course, the body breaks down the proteins in the food and then reassembles them into the proteins that we need. But everything that happens in our, in our body comes from, from uh, what we put into our mouth. And it is therefore you know, true to say that, that our immune function is related to diet because everything that happens in the body is related to diet. But that's quite different from saying that there are specific foods that can quote boost um, immunity. But we see headlines like that all the time. Eating seaweed salad may boost immune function. Anytime that you see the word may in this kind of a context should already raise a, a bit of a red flag. Uh, because may is quite different from saying that it does something. It may, yeah, I mean, that's easy to say. Uh, little green men uh, from outer space may land in front of the White House tomorrow. Uh, chances are that that's not gonna happen. So in science, we, we are always perturbed when you say may, we wanna see is, or you know, some definitive term. Now, when we look at a study like this, eating seaweed salad may boost immune function. Uh, obviously, there is something that has triggered such a, a headline. So what, what is that? Well, you look at some study and here it is. Immunomodulating activity of seaweed extract on human lymphocytes in in vitro. The term in vitro means that it was in the lab. In vitro literally means in glass. So it means, you know, in a, in a Petri dish or, or in, a, in a test tube. Now look what they did here. They took extracts of eight different kinds of seaweeds and uh, studied what the effect is on lymphocytes, uh, type of uh, uh, white blood cell uh, in, in a Petri dish in, in the laboratory. They wanted to see how these would proliferate, what kind of chemicals they would release, would they you know, have any uh, potential immune system effect? And when you, know, you look at this, this, yes, yes, there seems to be something here that the uh, exposure to the seaweed does kind of crank up the chemicals that they produce, which may be involved in, in immunity. But obviously the human body is not a large test tube. And what happens in the laboratory under these conditions uh, cannot be directly you know, extrapolated to what happens in the body. The only thing that these kind of studies do is give researchers some ideas about where to go from here, how to study this further. And really the only way to, you, can, you can come to a conclusion about something like this, about you know, seaweed extract having a, an effect is to design a study whereby you would have two groups of people. One group would eat seaweed salad on a regular basis. The other one would not. Uh, everything else in their lifestyle and their diet would be the same. And then you might be able to tease out some kind of difference if there is a difference. But obviously, this would not be done over one day or two days. This would have to be a long-term study. So this is something that is, is virtually impossible to do both logistically and, uh, and economically. So we, we can't have a, an answer to this question about you know, whether or not eating seaweed is, is good for the immune system. I mean, there's some preliminary research here suggesting that there might be some, some benefit. 
but it's a long, long way from a Petri dish in the laboratory to what happens in, in the human body. On the other hand, I would say that, you know, there's, there's certainly no harm in eating uh, seaweed as a snack, if you, if you like this, it certainly is better than eating uh, uh, potato chips. Uh, it has kind of a, uh, what can I tell you, unusual taste. Uh, I would not put it into the uh, uh, palate tickling uh, category, but there are some people who really enjoy it. And um, uh, possibly, you know, it has some benefit, but we don't really know because the only studies done on, uh, were done in laboratory. So the bottom line here would be, look, if you're going to snack, yeah, I, I think one could argue that this is a better snack than eating potato chips or eating a, a cookie, but that's where we have to leave it for, uh, for now. Now, what about the overall diet? I, I think, you know, there's, there's no single food that has magical qualities as, you know, I've stated many times in many different talks. But what about the overall diet? Because there are many different kinds of, of, of diet, general uh, diet. And uh, here's one uh, that um, discusses the possibility of uh, an anti-inflammatory diet. You know that one of the complications of COVID-19 is inflammation. And uh, it is when the body goes into overdrive. Now, a certain amount of inflammation, of course, is, is, is beneficial because it, it, this is one way that the immune system goes into action. You know that if you cut your hand, well, what, what happens? Uh, first of all, it will start to swell, it will get red. And that's because white blood cells are rushing there to try to, to uh, prevent infection, to try to make sure that the blood clots, et cetera. Uh, but that inflammation, which is the redness and the swelling and the, uh, and the pain and the rise in temperature, that's what inflammation is, is actually the immune system going into action. However, sometimes the immune system goes into overdrive and this is one of the consequences of uh, COVID-19, as we have seen. The body perceives this as an extremely dangerous attacking species. It may well be. Well, it is. And it triggers this attack against it, uh, becoming what is called a cytokine storm. Cytokines are, are molecules of the immune system. And uh, when a lot of them are produced, that can have all kinds of negative consequences. Again, this, this points out another interesting feature is that, quote, boosting immunity is not always a good thing because there are many diseases that come about because the body's immune system has gone into overdrive. Things like arthritis, for example, or, or um, uh, type one diabetes. These are uh, what we call autoimmune diseases where the body recognizes some part of itself as if it were foreign and mounts an attack uh, against it. So in, in this particular case with COVID-19, yes, we know that sometimes there is excessive amount of inflammation and therefore it brings up the, the, the notion of anti-inflammatory foods. Is there such a thing? So that if you have a diet which is anti-inflammatory, are you going to be protected against a cytokine storm that might be generated by a COVID-19 infection? So what do they talk about in a paper such as this, about an anti-inflammatory uh, diet? These are diets that are said to be anti-inflammatory because you can actually measure what are known as inflammatory markers after eating such a, such a diet. And uh, some of the most widely used markers of inflammation are the C-reactive protein, the red blood cell sedimentation rate, how quickly these red blood cells settle in a test tube, and the viscosity of the plasma. All of these are markers for inflammation. So for example, when you have a situation like I, I suggested before, where you have an injury that, that you can see and uh, it becomes red, it becomes swollen, it becomes hot and it becomes painful. If you would do a blood test, 
you would find higher levels of C-reactive protein, higher sedimentation rate, and higher plasma viscosity. So this is what researchers look for when they are studying different diets. Now, in this particular paper, they argue for the Mediterranean diet as being anti-inflammatory. Because if you take a look at the um, blood samples of people who eat a Mediterranean diet, they will have fewer of these uh, uh, inflammation markers. Now, one problem here is that we talk often of the Mediterranean diet, but the fact is that there isn't one Mediterranean diet. There are many countries around the Mediterranean, right? And certainly the Italian diet is not the same as the Lebanese uh, uh, diet. Uh, it's not the same as the French diet. France is also you know, on, on the Mediterranean. Uh, but sort of the overall conclusion is that the Mediterranean diet is very low in refined foods. It's very low in processed foods. It's very low in red meat. So they eat fish, uh, they eat chicken, they eat lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, drink the glass of red wine on a, on a, a pretty regular basis, uh, but they don't have the, the white flour uh, in their diet. They, they don't have the uh, lots of potatoes, French fries, uh, et cetera. So what you're looking at here are the main features of a Mediterranean diet. Now, the other one that is said to be an anti-inflammatory diet is the Japanese diet. Again, uh, very, very low in any kind of uh, processed uh, carbohydrates and uh, virtually no red meat, uh, no processed meats, you know, no bacon, no, no, uh, no sausage. So these diets are very different from the North American diet, where we have lots of fried foods, lots of very, very sugary foods. You have the donuts, various diseases, lots of soft drinks. The Mediterranean diet and the Japanese diet are devoid of soft drinks. And they are very, very low in sweets. In the Mediterranean diet, dessert is usually something that is based on nuts. You don't have the, the cakes. You certainly don't have the, the donuts. Uh, Japanese desserts are, are almost non-existent. They, they don't tend to uh, have dessert. They, they probably have a, a green tea to finish off the, off the meal. So I think that there's a benefit to be had for an overall diet that lowers the markers of inflammation. And the Mediterranean and Japanese diets do that. The American diet raises the markers of, uh, of inflammation. And that makes uh, susceptibility to disease greater, including susceptibility to infection with COVID-19. So no one is going to say that we're looking at some kind of potential therapy here. No. I think what we can say is that it is possible that someone who has a, quote, good diet is going to be more resistant to any kind of uh, infection. But what people want are specific nutrients, they want specific recommendations. This is what people are always after, simple solutions to complex problems. <clears throat> well, what do we mean by specific nutrients? For example, zinc. As you probably know, there's been a lot of talk about zinc and, and COVID-19. And the reason that this is talked about is because zinc is one of those minerals which is part of many of the enzymes that play a role in the immune system. So it's certainly worthwhile to, to examine this because it is indeed crucial for the development and function of, of cells. I and mean, this is, this is where well, we know it's an essential nutrient. We must have it in, in the diet. Minerals are not something that the body can manufacture. So we have to get them in, in the diet, but we don't need very much. Uh, as you can see, the adequate intake is about eight milligrams for men and about 11 milligrams for women, which is, is very little. And the upper limit is, is about 40 milligrams per day. Now don't get the idea though, that if you have 45 milligrams or 50 milligrams, you're going to overdose. That has a, this has a, a large safety factor built into it. What it really means is that there's really no need at all to go above 40 milligrams per day because there's no demonstrated benefit of that. It isn't difficult to get all the zinc that we need 
in order for our immune system to function properly because it is found in so many foods. Everything that you see here uh, contains zinc and most people will have some, some, some of these. Uh, if you take a look uh, uh, here, lentils, pork chops, chicken, all of this contains zinc. So it is not likely in North America for someone to be deficient in, in zinc. But you also don't want to overdo it because while a deficiency in zinc does impair immune function, believe it or not, an excess of zinc does that as well. So that's why we are looking at what is called zinc homeostasis, that is having just the right amount. Uh, we have just the right balance of, of zinc to keep the immune system working uh, properly without going into, uh, into overdrive. Now, the reason that, that this has become a topic of discussion with COVID-19 is because it turns out that when you take blood samples from people who have COVID-19, you find that people who are infected are more likely to have low levels of, of zinc. That's an association. That cannot prove cause and effect. It just may mean that people have a, a very poor diet and they're probably low in all kinds of other uh, things as, as well. In North America, if you have a diet that supplies the daily value of zinc that we just looked at, which is around 10 milligrams, there's no evidence that taking more will boost the immune system. And deficiency in North America is, is, is quite uncommon. Now, there are supplements out there, and as you can see, this is 50 milligrams, which, which actually is above the, the maximum recommended daily intake. As I said, that has a huge safety factor built into it, so you don't need to worry about taking 50 milligrams. But we just don't have any evidence that, that it is of any benefit. Now, you see what they tell you on the label here, zinc is an essential mineral uh, that supports immune function. That, of course, is true. That's true, but that doesn't mean that more is, uh, is better. Also important in immune function is vitamin D, the so-called sunshine vitamin, which is a little bit of a misnomer because of course sunshine does not contain any vitamin, but sunshine does uh, stimulate the formation of vitamin D from precursors that are already present uh, in the skin. Now, the reason that we're interested in vitamin D now is because on top of the important role in plays in making sure that, that calcium gets absorbed, that we get proper uh, bone formation, it also has a role in the immune system. And uh, here there is a bit of a more, more of an issue than with zinc because it is possible, especially in our climate here, where in the winter, we don't get that much sunshine or at least we don't go out as much in, into the sunshine, it is possible to have low blood levels of, of vitamin D. The uh, uh, reason that we talk about it in connection with COVID-19 is because once again, uh, what researchers have found that low blood levels of vitamin D are associated with a greater risk of infection. And as you can see in this particular study here, 154 patients uh, presented to the medical center over six weeks and they had their uh, blood level of vitamin D uh, determined. And it turned out that those who had a low level of vitamin D, uh, which is generally less than 20 nanograms per milliliter, they had a greater risk of, uh, of complications. What this really means is that we wanna make sure that we have adequate levels of vitamin D. Doesn't mean that an excess is going to do uh, any good. But I think we can say here quite safely that there's absolutely no problem with taking a vitamin D supplement uh, of the order of a thousand IU uh, a day uh, because there's no downside to this and there could be an upside. Although again, I, I think for um, the average North American who has a, you know, a, a diet where they consume meat, they consume dairy products, they consume fruits and vegetables, unlikely of a deficiency. But for someone who never goes out into the sun, yeah, it's, it's possible. So I think it is a good idea uh, to take, uh, I think a thousand units is a, is a good amount to take. Uh, there's no risk here with, with, with overdose. And uh, it certainly does play a role in the immune system. 
Vitamin C. Again, the story is the same here. Vitamin C is important in so many reactions that occur in the body. And let's face it, life is really just the sum total of all the chemical reactions that go on in the body. And we know that vitamin C is important. I mean, we've, we were first alerted to, to, uh, to it really in, 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 in the media by Linus Pauling, who was arguably the, the you know, greatest chemist of the last century. Uh, his uh, book on, on uh, the covalent bond is used around the world in, in, in chemistry courses. And he also started promoting vitamin C uh, to ward off the common cold. He became convinced that this, this was uh, effective uh, uh, treatment. Very curious that he came to that conclusion because uh, he was obviously a top-notch scientist. And yet here, he was just talking about his own personal uh, anecdote. But because of who he was and his uh, legendary fame, uh, investigations were undertaken to see whether or not he was right about, you know, saying that vitamin C could prevent the, the common cold, because after all, you know, he was a Nobel Prize winning scientist. And uh, studies uh, uh, were done. And uh, as far as the common cold goes, it just turned out that there really wasn't anything there, except maybe at the first onset of the uh, scratchiness in your throat, if you start taking a, a gram an hour for three or four hours, you may be able to ward off some of the complications of the cold. But anyway, as far as we're concerned here, there is absolutely no doubt that vitamin C is essential for the body. I mean, let's face it, that's what uh, vitamins are. These are substances that we must have in the diet because the body cannot manufacture it, which are essential for life. So it's not surprising that vitamin C is important and that it plays a role in so many different reactions in the body, including those that are part of the immune system. But again, that doesn't mean that taking extra doses is uh, something to be recommended. We do not need very much vitamin C. And anyone who eats vegetables or fruits to, to any extent is going to have enough uh, vitamin C. There are people now who are overdoing it uh, because uh, they've been uh, fed this idea that vitamin C is, is uh, somehow a potential treatment for uh, COVID-19 or, or is prophylactic for disease for which we have no evidence whatsoever. In fact, in China, they have even used large doses of intravenous vitamin C, 35 grams a day, grams, not milligrams. And uh, there really hasn't been any uh, result uh, coming uh, out of that. So yes, we need a proper diet with lots of fruits and vegetables. We're not going to, to prevent COVID-19 uh, by quote, boosting our immune system with vitamin C. And yet this is exactly the kind of silliness that's out there on the internet. Slices of lemon in a cup of hot water can save your life. The hot lemon can kill the proliferation of the pro novel coronavirus. This is absolute nonsense. The only reason to drink hot water with lemon in it is if you like to drink hot water with lemon in it. This has no therapeutic uh, value whatsoever. This is just total nonsense. <clears throat> Something, however, that is interesting and is not total nonsense, uh, is the potential value of fermented foods. Now, what are fermented foods? Fermentation is a term that is bandied about <laughs> quite commonly these days, but most people don't really have an understanding of what fermentation is. Fermentation is a process where some sort of chemical change is introduced and usually by the action of enzymes, enzymes are special proteins that are, bio, they are biological catalysts. And they are released by microbes like yeasts or bacteria or molds. And if they bring about desirable changes, which uh, of course is what we're after, then what we're looking at is, is fermentation. Study of fermentation is known as zymology, zymology. So fermentation is just the sum total of chemical reactions, desirable chemical reactions that are brought about by the action 
of yeasts, bacteria, molds in a food. And although people normally think of, of uh, bacteria or molds as, as being bad, that is not necessarily the case. It depends which kind of bacteria and which kind of mold. We have been consuming fermented foods since the dawn of civilization. Uh, of course, the oldest one is uh, probably uh, the fermentation of grape juice to make wine. The white stuff that you see on the surface of grapes, that's yeast. When you mash up the grapes, you mix the yeast with the juice and the yeast releases enzymes that convert the sugars in the grape to alcohol and carbon dioxide, plus a whole range of tasty substances, which is of course, why we like to drink wine, of course, the alcohol as, as well. This is a, a old, old process of uh, fermentation. Also, fermentation uh, with bacteria is different than fermentation with yeast. Fermentation with bacteria usually involves bacteria that release lactic acid, which acts as a preservative. So fermentation of, of vegetables is one of the oldest known preservative processes because of course, before refrigeration, uh, there had to be some way of trying to keep food because not everyone was able to, to go out and harvest food every day. And fermentation was one of the first ways uh, that you could preserve food because the lactic acid acts as a, a, a preservative. The first real scientific studies on fermentation were carried out by Louis Pasteur in France. And here is a rather remarkable picture. Uh, one of the few photographs of, of Louis Pasteur actually here seen studying fermentation. He was the one that recognized the fact that fermentation was brought about by uh, living microbes, whether they are yeast or, or bacteria. And that if you kill these by heat treatment, that is if you pasteurize them, which is of course where the term comes from, then you are not going to have any fermentation. And uh, this obviously is not desired when you want to, to make wine or when you want to preserve foods through fermentation, but it is desired when you're trying to kill off disease causing organisms. That's when you want to, to pasteurize. It was Eli Mechnikov, uh, a Russian microbiologist who first introduced the idea that fermented foods could in fact be healthy. And his uh, example was Bulgaria, where he said, look, you have a lot of people in Bulgaria who are very old, but look very young. They live for 110, 120 years. Although of course we don't really know because they never had any birth certificates, but they ate a lot of yogurt. And uh, Metchnikov was able to show that yogurt was steaming with live bacteria. And he suggested that these were bacteria that were healthy. Turns out he wasn't wrong about that. I mean, of course it isn't the magic bullet, but there certainly is something to this. And uh, John Harvey Kellogg of Kellogg cereal fame, who ran a sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan, where people from all over the world came to be cured of diseases that they never had. Anyway, he was a big proponent of yogurt. He said, if you want good health, you have to drink yogurt every day. And uh, he also had another way of introducing yogurt into the body to the rear portals. Yogurt enema was his treatment for various digestive uh, diseases. Yogurt is indeed a very interesting fermented food because it is steaming with bacteria. So during fermentation, what happens is that these bacteria produce lactic acid and uh, the lactic uh, acid comes from the starches and the sugars that are naturally present in this case in the milk in, in, in the first place. And uh, indeed the, uh, the reason that a lot of people who are so-called lactose intolerant, lactose is the sugar that is found in, in, in milk, can eat yogurt because the lactic acid bacteria break down the lactose and convert it into lactic acid. In any case, when you're using lactic acid bacteria to try to preserve foods as we do with fermented vegetables, as we'll see in a second with things like sauerkraut and kimchi, 
At first, you have to add salt to make sure that disease-causing organisms don't grow until the lactic acid is produced, which will then act as a, a preservative. So these fermented foods will generally tend to have a significant amount of salt because of, of that reason. The bacteria that are found in uh, these fermented foods fall into this category, which we simplistically call good bacteria, as opposed to the potentially disease-causing bacteria like Salmonella and E. coli. The good bacteria are things like the lactobacillus, the bifido uh, uh, bacteria, which don't cause disease. Turns out that if we can increase the numbers of these good bacteria in our gut, which can happen because the fermented foods are full of these good bacteria, they will compete for food with the bad bacteria in our gut. And if there are enough of these good bacteria, they will starve out the bad bacteria because they will gobble up all the food. What is their food? It is whatever we eat that we cannot digest. What we call fiber, things like cellulose and uh, certain kinds of indigestible starch. But these bacteria can dine on them. We don't like them, but they find them as tasty morsels. Well, the more of these good bacteria you have, the fewer of the bad bacteria you have. And that of course is why it can reduce the chance of digestive problems. But there's more here because these bacteria also are important in the immune function. And the chemistry here is quite complicated, but they improve immune reactions, the bacteria uh, do. And we have evidence for this. I mean, there are all kinds of papers now that are being published on the health benefits of, of fermented foods and how the lactic acid bacteria squeeze out other bacteria, how they induce the formation of various nutrients that, that are, 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 are beneficial. Uh, studies like this, for example, where they looked at a number of countries and they take a look at uh, the diet and the countries that consume a lot of fermented foods have fewer infectious diseases. Now, again, this is an association. You can't hang your hat on this one because of course there are many other possible differences in the diet here too, other than just fermented uh, uh, foods. But it, it certainly is interesting. And then you have a, a study like this, which is the kind of study that we like to see because it's an interventional study where they took two groups of people and they deprived one of fermented foods. So they were told to eat nothing, nothing, no cheese, that's fermented, no yogurt, no, no fermented soy products, no beer, no wine, nothing that had been fermented by bacteria for a couple of weeks. And then they took a look at their blood profile to see what the differences were. And there was a decided drop in the so-called short chain fatty acids that are produced by these good bacteria. And these are the ones that rev up the immune system because they, they again, it's a, some pretty, pretty complicated chemistry here, but uh, they're the ones who play a role in increasing the activity of the phagocytes. These are these white blood cells that, that I mentioned earlier, which engulf intruders and just chop them up. And also it turned out that in this study, uh, once they started to reintroduce fermented foods into their diet, uh, the levels of the short chain fatty acids increased, which is exactly what you, you want to see. Here's another fascinating study. This was done in Korea. And uh, the researchers were able to induce 12 women to live in a dormitory for a week uh, where they would uh, uh, basically be very inactive they would eat a very, very simple diet. Uh, and the only difference between two groups, they would divide into two, two groups, is that one group uh, would be fed a low dose of kimchi, which is a, a national fermented uh, cabbage food in, 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 in Korea. And the other group would be fed a high dose of kimchi to see what the outcome would be. Now, kimchi is, is, is very interesting. This is essentially fermented cabbage together with a lot of different uh, uh, spices. Uh, sometimes they add other vegetables as well, uh, like radishes, and it tends to be pretty spicy, often eaten on a, on a bed of rice. 
and Koreans eat this all the time. In fact, often two or three times uh, a day. And uh, there's a long history here of how this is fermented in these, these jars. As you can see, they have tops because for fermentation, you have to exclude air. The bacteria that, that grow are, are anaerobic. That is, you know, they, they don't survive well in an oxygenated um, uh, atmosphere. And uh, this, this really is the national spice or the, the national food of, of Korea. And now, of course, it's, uh, it's available in, in jars as well. The bacteria that are present on the cabbage in the first place are lactobacilli of various types. There are many different bacteria. And these are the so-called probiotics, the good bacteria. But cabbage also has a great deal of fiber which is food for those bacteria, enable them to multiply. And this bacterial food is what we refer to as prebiotics. So kimchi is a food that has both probiotics and prebiotics. We call it a symbiotic. And it's interesting that the, the, the health status of Koreans is, is very good compared to the North America. They have a greater longevity. Uh, they suffer fewer infections. Uh, of course, it's hard to say that it's because of the kimchi, but it's an interesting possibility. So now getting back to these ladies who lived for a week in this dormitory and gave fecal samples on a daily basis, which were then analyzed. And the result was that those that were eating the high kimchi diet had greater amounts of three different kinds of lactic acid bacteria. And these are the so-called good bacteria. It's an interesting kind of, uh, of finding. The Koreans are so into this that when they selected an astronaut who was going to go into space, uh, they designed a special type of kimchi that would go along with him. Uh, this kimchi though had to be sterilized by radiation because they didn't want to, to have any chance of, of any kind of you know, bacteria proliferating in space. So there was, there was a big deal about this special kimchi that was developed by the astro for the astronaut. Unfortunately, he never made it into space. He was supposed to go on a Soyuz aircraft, a, a Russian one, but he got into some sort of tiff during training in Russia and was sent back to, to Korea. So he never made it into space. So, so far, as far as we know, no kimchi ever made it into, into space. Sauerkraut, of course, is also fermented cabbage, uh, quite different from kimchi because it doesn't have all of the other spices that are added to it. It, it is just uh, uh, cabbage, uh, but it is fermented, so it has beneficial bacteria. It also has sodium. This is one thing that you have to watch for. Uh, as I said, uh, when you ferment, you first have to add salt uh, because the disease-causing bacteria uh, are more likely to grow first. So you want to prevent that from happening until the lactic acid bacteria can take over. Uh, so uh, you have to keep an eye on this because a cup of sauerkraut or kimchi has about 50 milligrams of sodium and the daily maximum should be about 2300 milligrams. So that you, know, you can approach that very easily just by eating sauerkraut or, 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 or kimchi. And of course, uh, very often the sauerkraut, at least in Europe, is eaten with uh, questionable food, such as uh, various kinds of wieners and, and uh, uh, sausages, which are high in fat and high in salt, that will add to the uh, salt that you also get in, in, in the sauerkraut. So generally a meal uh, like this would not be a particularly healthy meal, despite the fact that you have the beneficial bacteria in the, in the sauerkraut. Not all uh, vegetables that you get in jars are fermented. And this is something that is important to understand. Pickles, for example, may not be fermented. They just may be what are called vinegar pickles. And an easy way to remember this is whether or not the, the vegetable, that is the cucumber or anything else, is pickled or fermented is that, that uh, if you follow the, uh, the recipe, if it starts out by just adding vinegar, then that is not going to be uh, a ferment, fermented uh, product. And uh, that will not have the health properties that we associate with uh, uh, fermentation. 
And you can tell if you look at the recipe, for example, here's a recipe for making um, uh, pickles. And uh, so it's of course, cucumbers, water and vinegar, salt and, and, and sugar. Uh, and as soon as you see that you start by adding vinegar, then this is not going to be a fermented product. It may still taste good, but, but it will not have the health benefits. The ones that will have the health benefits are the ones that are legitimately fermented like kimchi and yogurt, sauerkraut, miso, kefir, tempeh. In the case of yogurt and kefir, at least you don't have to worry about the, the salt content. Sourdough bread is also a fermented food. Sourdough itself, the, the reason that it is sour is because of the lactic acid that is produced by, uh, by bacteria. So certainly one can make a case for sourdough bread being healthier than the, the general white bread that many North Americans eat. You can also put some fermented sausage on it. And this is one of the most famous sausages uh, in Europe. This is Pix Hungarian salami, very, very tasty. Uh, it's fermented, so you know it's uh, made with a bacterial culture. It also has a mold on the surface, that white mold, which releases chemicals that add extra flavor. But here we have a case where even though it's a fermented food, one would not put this into the healthy category because of the high concentration of salt and, and fat, and that would outweigh the beneficial uh, bacteria. So this is something that you would eat once in a while for the taste. You would not want to make a regular habit of it. On the other hand, with yogurt and with kefir, you can make a regular habit. Uh, stick to the plain ones though, because those will not have uh, any added sugar. And again, here you don't have to worry about the salt as we do with some of the others. Kombucha is also a fermented beverage and uh, it gets a, a bit, you have to get used to the taste. Uh, I don't particularly uh, like it. Uh, I, I would, if I want the fermented food, I would rather eat uh, kefir or, or yogurt. But a lot of people uh, like this. Again, it will have the beneficial uh, bacteria. Then the question comes up, uh, what about leaving all of those fermented foods and instead just using a supplement like a probiotic? Uh, the problem here is that we don't really know what is in there, which bacteria are in there and whether or not they survive passage through the stomach. So the jury is still out on this. I think it is better to focus on fermented foods for getting these beneficial bacteria. Uh, Again, make sure that when you're eating the fermented foods, they are really fermented and not just pickled with, with vinegar. And again, the warning here is, is that they tend to be high in salt. So you do want to, to watch that. Uh, I don't think that you, know, you should look at this as drugs, that is to eat it several times a day. But I think you can make a habit of eating some fermented food on, on a regular uh, uh, basis. Now, of course, there are other foods now that are being, you know, uh, promoted for immune benefits, etc. Things like like uh, turmeric, uh, and they'll, you know, point at studies uh, again in the laboratory uh, showing some benefit. Um, the jury is out on this one too. I think if eventually it turns out that curcumin does have value. Uh, it will be in significantly higher doses than what you would normally put in, 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 into food. And again, things like lemon and, and mango, uh, you'll see ads on the internet promoting it as an anti-COVID World Health Organization. And of course, scientific community says, no, there is nothing to this. Or garlic, uh, again, promoted as a, you know, uh, anti-COVID food. The only thing it does is keep vampires away. And uh, it does that. I'm sure if you eat garlic, you'll testify that you've not seen a vampire. Well, finally, although it isn't magic, but we can make a case for eating chicken soup as beneficial in terms of uh, revving up some aspects of the immune system. Uh, chicken soup, of course, sometimes referred to as Jewish penicillin. And believe it or not, it was first introduced by Maimonides way back in the 13th century as potential treatment for colds and the flu. Today, of course, it still has this legendary aura 
uh, where you have to pick out a nice looking chicken and cook it up with lots of vegetables. But you know what? There actually have been trials done on this to see if it has any special property. And it turns out that actually there is better than just hot water. Chicken soup actually increases the rate of secretion of nasal mucus. It washes out intruders more effectively. And on top of it, it tastes good. So I, I think this is something that we can recommend uh, both as potentially being healthy and as tasting good. Uh, I'm not sure about the commercial variety, but the, the one that you make at home. But maybe eventually we'll find the secret ingredient in chicken soup and be able to market it and uh, see whether or not it has any effect on our immune system. But I leave you with this final note is that uh, you can increase your immune activity probably more by exercise than by anything that you put into your mouth. And studies have shown that a 45 minute walk will increase your natural killer cell activity. That's part of the uh, immune system. So there is a look for you at immunity, immune function. Uh, uh, of course, uh, one could give a whole course on this. So we've only skimmed uh, the surface. And we have a lot more stuff on this on our website, which you can always check out. It's mcgill.ca slash OSS, which is also where you can go to sign up for our uh, free weekly newsletter. So that's it. We have run out of time here. And uh, I don't know if uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions that uh, we may be able to entertain, but thanks for your attention. Dr. Schwartz, a question did pop up in the Q&A okay. here from Daniel. Uh, the question is, does bacteria for fermentation occur naturally or does it have to be added? Yes, it, it uh, can occur naturally. Like when you make kimchi or when you uh, sauerkraut, it's uh, the naturally occurring bacteria that are already present on, on the food. Uh, in some cases, uh, you add a starter culture, like usually with sourdough bread, you would add a starter culture uh, first. Uh, yogurt, you generally add a starter culture. Uh, so it depends on what it is that you're fermenting. Generally, when you're fermenting vegetables, uh, they already have uh, sufficient bacteria on them to start the fermentation. With dairy foods, you generally have to add, uh, add the, the culture. Uh, 